Do you have a paranormal encounter you'd like to share with us? Send us an email with your story for a chance of it being featured on Weird World. In the autumn of 1988, Greg and Carla relocated to an historic dwelling in North Manchester, United Kingdom, marking a fresh beginning following the untimely passing of their infant son to SIDS just the year before. The event had been so traumatic for Carla that it required her hospitalisation for an extended period with ongoing outpatient care. The heartbreaking discovery of their lifeless baby had been hers. While Carla was receiving medical care, Greg embarked on a search for a new home. Their previous residence had already been sold and they were nearing the closing date. Greg was yet to find a suitable house when Carla was discharged. However, a few days into her homecoming, during a short vacation, they stumbled upon an alluring three-storey Victorian property for sale. They were both captivated by the house, but for distinct reasons. Greg, a lawyer with architectural fascination, was enamoured with its age and style. Carla, an artist, was attracted by its unique complex charm. Despite this, she also felt a vague dread, which she attributed to her still shaky emotional state. However, this feeling she kept to herself. They reached out to the listing agent that day and a house tour was promptly arranged, with them being updated on recent refurbishments. The attic had been entirely revamped, the house rewired and a new roof installed. But again, Carla felt a dread creeping in. A hint of claustrophobia, despite the property's grandeur and lofty ceilings. Unbeknown to her, Greg experienced the same unease. They both noticed odd cold areas in a couple of locations, which made them apprehensive. Regardless, they were both thrilled and slightly taken aback when their initial offer was swiftly accepted. Greg surmised that this was likely due to the property still needing considerable work, despite the renovations. The current owners were also anxious about potential squatters. While Greg and Carla were overjoyed by their unexpected fortune, this feeling of destiny about the whole venture also unnerved Carla. With assistance from close friends, they started unpacking and setting up their new home on October 31st, All Hallows' Eve. The Halloween custom of trick-or-treating had made its way to England and they took turns handing out lollies as they arranged their new space. The celebratory ambience, costume parade and crisp autumn air lifted their spirits, later toasting to their new beginnings with wine by the crackling fireplace. When a pair of children in ghost costumes came trick-or-treating, Carla humorously pondered about the peculiarities of their new home and the possibility of unseen occupants, not anticipating the truth of her words. After their friends had left and the Halloween festivities ended, Greg and Carla slumped by the fireplace, sharing a sigh of relief. Their exhaustion was so profound that they thought they heard a return sigh, followed by strange knocks from above. Having decided to rent out the ground floor and attic apartments, they felt quite at ease on the second floor. The thought of living in the attic never crossed their minds. Something about it felt wrong, like the unseen presence of a deceased creature within the walls. Not so much an actual smell, but more of an unsettling sense. The attic neither seemed welcoming nor comfortable, and the peculiar noises didn't help their peace of mind. Eventually that evening, they succumbed to their tiredness and plunged into a profound sleep. Carla dreamt of their late son trick-or-treating in a ghost costume. In the distant echoes of her dream, she heard a baby's cry. The small ghost-costumed boy looked at Carla and warned, You should leave here, Mummy, before she finds you. Carla attempted to question him, but he only frowned and faded into the dream's landscape. As the young boy drifted further away, the cries of a baby grew nearer. She tried to reach out to her son, but he had vanished. Waking up with a jolt, her face was drenched in tears. Glancing over, she checked if Greg was asleep. She saw that the clock displayed 3.17am, 
And then she heard it, a baby sob. It wasn't a figment of her dream, but how could it be reality? Where was it originating from? She was consumed by a bone-chilling terror, worried that she might be on the verge of another mental collapse. She quietly slipped out of bed to investigate, tracing the source of the wails. Trudging down the dim corridor, she was drawn in by the sound. It guided her to the door leading to the internal staircase, connecting the house's four levels. She slowly opened the door, peering into the hazy darkness. The cry was emanating from the attic. Her heartbeat echoed in her ears. Despite her urge to ascend the stairs, she was rooted to the spot. The sound of something stirring behind her made her gasp silently. The sight of Greg brought immense relief. Their eyes met and then shifted towards the attic. He had heard it too. She wasn't going insane. This fact both comforted and scared Carla. As they stood in that moment of uncertainty, unsure of the next course of action, the crying suddenly stopped. Freed from the spell, Carla fell into Greg's arms, weeping. Greg led her back into their apartment. Seating her at the kitchen table, he poured them each a generous helping of brandy. Cradling her glass, Carla finally vocalised their shared concern. What's going on here? Could there be squatters with a baby upstairs? Despite its unlikeliness, Greg decided to check. As he suspected, the attic remained as they had first seen it, save for a wheelchair and a table. There was no sign of any other occupants. But the ghostly wailing would only resurface once more. The next day, Greg's best friend and law firm partner, Mark, came over to assist with some house repairs. Mark had been an immense source of support to both Greg and Carla after their son's passing, almost like family. Thus, Greg had no qualms sharing the previous night's eerie experience. While installing smoke detectors, he recounted the story to Mark. They decided to dismiss it as a result of fatigue and stress. At 3.17 the following morning, the shrill sound of the new smoke detector jolted them awake. They leapt out of bed, frantic to find the suspected fire. They could detect the scent of smoke, but no visible signs of one. They hurriedly checked the entire house, even though the alarm seemed specific to their apartment. But again, no hints of any fire could be found anywhere. A mix of relief, confusion and irritation washed over them. A faulty smoke detector seemed plausible, but what about the smoke's smell and haze? This house was indeed peculiar. Despite all this, Carla was gearing up for their first Christmas in the new house. While preparing invitations for their Christmas party, Greg and Carla humorously considered inviting an exorcist. They set up a faux spruce pine in their living room. They would have preferred a real one, but didn't want to risk an actual fire. The smoke detector kept sounding false alarms, always at the same time, 3.17 a.m. Forced to disconnect it, Greg still couldn't stop the phantom fire occurrences. Carla suggested consulting a psychic, but Greg brushed it off as an overreaction. That is, until the morning of December 7th. Carla was stirred from her deep sleep by an unknown disturbance. She cast a quick look at the digital clock. Once more, she detected the subtle scent of smoke, but this time it was paired with what seemed to be shimmering lights, or perhaps flames, seemingly originating from the living room, just a few steps from their bedroom. Carla was contemplating if they had forgotten to turn off the Christmas tree lights, when a shape, projecting a sinister shadow, gradually entered her field of vision. The dark figure calmly drifted down the hall until it, or more accurately she, became visible. The ghostly apparition was a young woman with flowing dark brown hair draped in a lengthy white nightgown. She floated past the bedroom doorway, but as she was about to drift out of sight, she stopped suddenly. It was as though she had just noticed Carla. The spectral entity turned her head and Carla found herself locked in the phantom's gaze. 
A shiver ran through Carla. She yearned to scream and wake Greg, but she was frozen in that moment, a moment that seemed to stretch into infinity. Carla was swept over by a wave of melancholy and unbearable sorrow. She observed a glisten of tears on the young woman's face as she extended her arms out. Then, to Carla's horror, the spectre began to transform into a burnt effigy of herself, devoured by an unseen fire. The lengthy hair began to smoulder as if about to burst into flames. The previously pouting mouth was substituted by a grimace stuck in a silent shriek. The hands that had been reaching out now resembled charred, twisted talons, cracked open by the heat to expose bone beneath. The eyes, once sad and teary, were replaced by gaping blood-red hollows that still seemed to hold the power of sight. The whole apparition took on shades of black, red and unsightly tone of bluish-grey. The dreadful vision sent colour into shock. Her screams woke Greg and the apparition vanished as he jolted upright. He turned to identify the cause of Carla's distress. He thought he saw something like the traces of a vanishing image, but he couldn't discern it clearly. He switched on the bedside lamp and took the trembling Carla into his embrace. Eventually she quieted down enough to recount the experience to him, insisting that either the house was haunted or she was experiencing a mental breakdown. She demanded that they bring in a psychic, and this time Greg offered no opposition. He could no longer dismiss these occurrences. They had escalated into something far more serious, and, he feared, potentially dangerous. They promptly organised a visit from a psychic through a friend. The friend vouched for the psychic's legitimacy, sharing her own encounters with him to Greg and Carla. His name was Ian Ainsworth. At 44, he had been an unwilling medium between the living and the dead since his childhood. After years of grappling with his unusual talent, he finally accepted it by using it to aid both the living and the departed. He hoped he could do the same here. The seance was arranged for the evening of December the 12th. In attendance were Carla, Greg, Mark and Deanna, the friend who had connected them with the psychic. Since most of the supernatural incidents seemed centred on the second floor, Ian chose to hold the seance there. But first he conducted a walkthrough of the house. He started in the attic. As he would later express, he was astounded by the energy there and couldn't wait to leave, feeling as though the walls were closing in on him. He sensed similar feelings on the second floor, but they were more of grief and intense sorrow. He didn't feel as claustrophobic outside of the attic flat. However, in the living room, he found it difficult to suppress the urge to weep and groan in severe emotional anguish. Having thus assessed the spiritual atmosphere in the house, the small group convened in a circle around a table in the living room lit by the cosy flickering flames in the fireplace and the Christmas tree lights. Ian initiated the seance by calling upon a protective white light to surround those within the circle. He urged everyone to maintain the integrity of the circle and they clasped hands as Ian began to descend into a trance state. The only sounds were the subtle rhythmic breathing of the attendees and the sporadic howling of the wind. Several moments elapsed before the tranquillity was interrupted by the gentle voice of the psychic calling out to the home spirits. The previously familiar noises of breathing were substituted by the wheezy, strained breathing of an unseen entity. It seemed that someone else had become part of this small assembly. A cold breeze swirled around the circle. A faint scent of smoke filled the room, but now it was paired with the unmistakable odour of burning. The air felt electrified and everyone noted the prickling sensation on their scalps and the rising of tiny hairs on their arms. The tree's lights began to twinkle erratically. The flames in the fireplace blazed and spat out sparks. It required the combined willpower of the whole group to maintain the circle. 
Ian once more pleaded with the house spirits to make themselves known. As far as Carla was concerned, they had done enough revealing already. They heard the strained breathing once more, as if someone was labouring to speak. Ian reassured the spirit that they were safe in a space filled with people who only wished to help. Despite the cool December evening, the living room grew incredibly warm, almost to a stifling degree, but they dared not break the circle to shed their sweaters. Ian descended further into his trance, reaching out to this distraught, lost soul. His body quivered and jolted as he finally made contact, and his eyes opened wide as if reacting to the shock. His face looked distressed. He started to speak in a subdued, tormented manner. It was his voice, but like the breathing before it, it sounded as if he was struggling greatly to vocalise. He would later say he felt as though he was trying to speak with vocal cords that were sore and damaged. My name is Catherine, he eventually managed to utter, followed by several harsh coughs. The group was afraid he might be choking, but instead he repeated, My name is Catherine, drawing in a long, laborious breath, followed by a ghastly shriek. A scream filled with agony, sadness and complete desperation. A primordial cry. It was like the scream of a banshee, cutting right through the listeners. This time, they couldn't resist breaking the circle. In a flash, it felt as though they were brought back to the realm of the living. Ian nearly slumped forward onto the table, and to Carla's concern, coughed a bit of blood into his handkerchief. He dismissed her worry with a polite wave. He, along with the others, took several deep breaths to recenter themselves. More than one appeared feeble and shaking. Both Mark and Greg were in a state of shock. Their friend Deanna made a beeline for the light switch. Gradually, they retained their composure enough to begin conversing. Greg went to the kitchen and returned with some brandy and glasses. Ian declined and requested only a glass of water and an aspirin. Once they were all settled, he started to reveal what he had perceived from his connection with this spirit. It was that of a 17-year-old girl named Catherine. She existed on the property if you could call it existence, with her elderly grandmother who was confined to a wheelchair and afflicted with several diseases, including dementia. The grandmother was entirely reliant on Catherine. She stayed on the top floor, but Catherine spent most of her time in the apartment Greg and Carla now occupied, if only to get away from the old woman. Regardless, the old woman would summon Catherine from the attic apartment by causing a loud ruckus or banging on the floor. That explained the noises Greg and Carla had heard coming from the empty attic. It would also clarify the mysterious sounds of a squeaky wheel moving back and forth through the apartment. This poor young woman was trapped in death just as she had been in life. She had had no friends and wasn't able to attend school until a fire claimed them both. Catherine, drained from exhaustion, had dozed off while dinner was in the oven. The second floor apartment was soon swathed in smoke. She endeavoured to climb the stairs to fetch her grandmother, who was emitting piercing screams from the attic, but she fell unconscious halfway up the stairs. She perished there, frozen in a crawling position by the flame and heat. Ian had made contact with numerous lost spirits over time, but never had he felt such a profound desire to liberate a soul as he did for this poor miserable girl. An unfounded feeling of failure seemed to trap her, so he would need to help her perceive the events of her life and death in a more realistic light. He re-established the connection and worked with Catherine until she not only glimpsed the light, but entered it. The house's ambience was no longer foreboding and it felt as though a weight had been lifted. Although there was no certainty, everyone sensed that Catherine had journeyed into the light and was finally at peace. Greg and Carla lit a special prayer candle in her memory on Christmas Eve. As they prepared to retire for the night, they moved to blow out the candle, but before doing so, they clasped hands and uttered, Rest in peace, Catherine, along with our son. With that, 
The candle's flame blazed a brilliant white and blue for about 30 seconds before self-extinguishing. Carla hoped this was a promising sign. That night, the little boy who had donned the ghost costume once more appeared in Carla's dreams. A profound sense of dread washed over her as he repeated his earlier warning to flee the house before she discovers them. Carla was jerked awake from the nightmare by a baby's cries. They echoed from the attic again. Carla was certain it wasn't her son. These wails belonged to a malevolent entity aiming to distress her. As Ian had suspected and the rest had feared, Catherine hadn't been the only spirit in the house. But this spirit was not a poor lost soul seeking guidance to any light. Carla intuitively felt it was the unhinged old woman and she was genuinely scared. Although the forensic analysis which was conducted of the property after the fire confirmed that food had indeed been left in the oven, its conclusion was that the most probable cause of it was actually defective electrical wiring. It had been smouldering behind an attic wall for hours before finally catching fire in the early morning, perhaps around 3.17am. Greg and Carla persist in the house despite the presence that remains with them. They have experienced other paranormal activity, but nothing as traumatic as when they initially moved in. However, they still struggle to retain tenants in the attic apartment. Even as terrifying as the ordeal was, Carla feels a sense of tranquility for the first time since their son's passing. She feels that having had the chance to free a trapped soul has, in a way, freed her own. She believes it's no coincidence that they felt so drawn to the house initially. Greg shares her sentiments, but he believes that we linger in the earthly stratosphere for a brief period, then we begin to dissipate, merging back into the fabric of the universe. He believes that tragic events can tether you to this earthly plane, whether you're alive or dead. Even though he wouldn't look forward to another such encounter, he's grateful for having been a part of it, for he too feels transformed and deeply awed by the hidden world which lies beneath the lives we lead. Carla continues to see the psychotherapist who supported her through the tragic events, but now with the goal of exploring the significance of it all. In response to a question from Carla, the psychotherapist clarified that at no point, even when Carla was in the throes of crisis or grief, did she exhibit hallucinatory or delusional behaviour. In fact, he was concerned that, if anything, she was overly rational. 